and progress of North Carolina in their minds. But that's not what we talked about. We talked about the moral vision of public service some three years ago, before he passed. We talked about values and progress and using political power to empower the people to build a better state. And then we had this conversation about the similarities between progressive mountain populism yes. that believes you don't kick people when they are down. Yes. You care for your neighbors. Yes. You care for their well-being. Yes. And that mount, progressive mountain populism believes that we should work every day and use our positions, our power, our prestige, and our personhood to build a fair, and justice community for everybody. And then we talk about how in civil rights activism, we believe in love for fellow man and equal protection under the law and ensuring a just community. And we noted that day in our conversation that there was not a lot of difference between civil rights activism and progressive mountain populism because we all believe in justice, fair play, treating people right, and using political power for a better society. 
these, these are great principles. They are rooted in our deepest moral virtues. Whether it's in the ancient Jewish prophet Isaiah, reminding us, woe unto those who make unjust laws and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey, or the words of Jesus declaring that nations and societies, not merely individuals, will be judged by how we care for the least of these, or our national constitution that makes establishing justice and caring for the general welfare the first principles of a true democracy, or our own state constitution that has etched in its command that all political power should only be used for the good of the whole, that life, liberty, and the enjoyment of the fruit of your own labor and happiness are self-evident rights guaranteed by our Creator, that public education is a constitutional right, that equal protection under the law must be guaranteed, and in North Carolina's constitution that was written 146 years ago, it says the first duty of the state is how it provides charity, benevolence, and ensures the welfare to the poor. These are sacred things. I believe that deep within our being now, there is a longing for a moral compass in our state, even in our nation. For those of us who are moved by the cries of our brothers and our sisters, we know that like justice, the acts of caring for the vulnerable, embracing the stranger, healing the sick, protecting water workers, welcoming and being fair to all members of the human family, and educating all children should never be relegated to the margins of our social consciousness. These are, are not policy issues. These are not issues for some left versus right debate. These are the centerpieces of our deepest tradition, of our faith, our values, and our sense of morality and righteousness. We need a recovery of our moral compass. And the truth be told, it is against these values that the current policies are being implemented in our General Assembly. The extremist Tea Party legislators, led by Governor McCory, Speaker Tillis, and Senate Leader Berger, and their colleagues, four of them from up here in these mountains, who call themselves Republicans, but who have governed as far-right extremists. And what they are doing falls woefully short of our deepest and most sacred moral values. If we didn't love them, we wouldn't tell the truth. If we didn't love North Carolina, we wouldn't tell the truth. McCory, understand, we don't want you to go down on the wrong side of history. Tillis, we don't want you to go down on the wrong side of history. Berger, we don't want you to go down. Moffitt, uh, Rappadaka, we don't want you, but we must tell you the truth. You're wrong. say you're wrong for even calling yourselves Republicans. Now let me say why we don't refer to them as Republican, but instead as extremists. And why we don't see this as merely a battle between Republicans and Democrats, because we know progressive, sensible Republican, some of them went to jail with us. Abraham Lincoln, who stood for equality and justice, was a sensible Republican. Black and white Republicans who in the 1800s expanded voting rights and educational opportunity to those who had been enslaved. They were Lincoln Republicans. They rewrote the Constitution. They were re re reasonable Republicans. My granddaddy was a reasonable Republican who fought in World War I from the mountains of West Virginia. Teddy Roosevelt was a reasonable Republican who called for 
for health care at a minimum and a living wage and protection of the environment. Dwight Eisenhower, who right after the Brown versus Board of Education case said that public education was a matter of national security and he invested more money in public education than any other president before him. He was a reasonable Republican. Republicans and Democrats alike signed off on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Oh, don't mess with us. We know our history. Black, black Republicans like Edward Brooks and Ralph Bunch and Benjamin Hooks, a past president of the NAACP, championed the cause of justice and freedom and policies against poverty and stood up to the extremists of their time. Even Ronald Reagan supported earned income tax credit. So when these legislators don't even support earned income tax credit, they aren't Republicans because they make Ronald Reagan look like a liberal. In North Carolina, there was a history of Republicans and Democrats like Holzhauser, who put more money into rural economic development, working for the common good. But now the party has been hijacked by extremists who are using their temporary power trying to do permanent damage. And that is why this, my friend, that you see streamed all over the nation today is no mere hyperventilation. It is no mere partisan gathering. Oh no, this is a fight for the future and the soul of our state. And it does not matter what the critics call us. They can deride us, they can deflect us because they cannot debate us. They can't make their case on moral and constitutional ground. And you don't have to call us. You can call us a liberal, a bunch of liberals. You can call us communist, but it's not what you call us, it's what we answer to. And we know who we are. We are black, we are white, we are Latino, we are Native American, we are Democrat, we are Republican, we are independent, we are people of faith, we are people not of faith, who believe in a moral universe. We are natives, we are immigrants, we are business leaders, we are workers, we are doctors, we are the uninsured, we are gay, we are straight, we are students, we are retirees, we stand here, a quilt of many colors, we are united in our efforts to fight for the soul of our state. We know who we are. We are the mountains. We are the coastlands. We are North Carolina. We are America. This is what democracy looks like. It's about the moral center of our body politics. McCorry, Tillis, and Berger and their extremist colleagues had a premeditated agenda. And what's sad is that it, their, their agenda is so simple in its imagination that it's scary. It's scary to think that they actually believe what they're selling. Because in essence, this is what their policies say. And this is what they want us to believe. According to them, if you want a North Carolina where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great, then here's how you get there, according to them. Cut and dismantle and deny opportunity to public education. Hurt teachers. Drive North Carolina funding to almost last in the nation. And give public school dollars to private schools. According to them. If you want a great state, deny health care no. and Medicaid expansion, no. especially to the elderly, the disabled, the blind, the children, the poor, and the working poor. And do it in a way that 500,000 people will not be eligible. Do it in a way that closes rural hospitals. Do it in a way that undermines what Republicans and Democrats 
did 60 years ago with the Hill Burton Act when they first funded rural hospitals. Do it in such a way that a young lady who sat in Tom Tillis' office a few weeks ago and was arrested as a full-time worker, a mother works on minimum wage who has cervical cancer. He wouldn't even come meet with her. And she could have gotten coverage under Medicaid expansion. But now she has to choose between feeding her children, going without insurance, and possibly dying. No. They claim that's the way to a better America, North Carolina. They say raise taxes on 89% of North Carolinians so you can give a tax break to 11%. And make sure you raise the sales tax so you can really hurt working poor people and poor people. They say if you want a great North Carolina, take and deny earned income tax credit from, and, and by the way, that, would, that has meant that 30,000 people in Buncombe, Hayward, Yancey, Mitchell, and Madison County alone lost their earned income tax credit. They claim if you want a great North Carolina, take unemployment from those who lost their jobs from no fault of their own. And if you really want a great North Carolina, stand against labor rights, stand against women's rights, stand against LGBT rights, and stand against fair immigration rights. And then if you really want a great North Carolina, take your orders from the Tea Party and the American Legislative Exchange Council. And after you've done that, and after you've created division, and after you've turned people against one another, if you really want a great North Carolina, they say pass the worst voter suppression bill since Jim Crow, change 40 laws, roll back our electoral processes, and undermine access for women for students, for Latinos, for African Americans, and the poor, and then lie and say you did it all because you want voter integrity. Their entire agenda falls and fails the test of our deepest values. Despite the fact that McCory, Tillis, and Berger and their followers are claiming now we are seeing a Carolina comeback, well, we can see too. And we must come down on the side of reality over rhetoric. And the real numbers demonstrate that we're not in the middle of a Carolina comeback. We are in the middle of a Carolina setback. We know better. And so now, after you all pointed out what they were doing, now they're trying to pull the okie dokie. You know, the midterm elections are coming. And they're trying to make Mr. Tillis look like a moderate. Too late. No matter how many times Mr. Tillis says he's a moderate, if your policies are regressive, if your budget is mean, if what you did last year is still impacting this year, and if you refuse to repeal it, then you are no moderate. You are an extremist. Oh, I had an uncle that used to say, if you water like a duck, and you quack like a duck, then you must be a duck. You got to own it now, Mr. Tillis. Somebody else out that I heard say you can put a leash on a rattlesnake and call it a poodle, but it'll still bite you. Oh, don't be fooled. Truth is, in this session, they didn't repeal any of the damage that they had already done. In fact, let me tell you how they're talking. In a News and Observer article the other day, one of their legislators said this, said it. This is the arrogance. I think we have passed enough controversial legislation last session to last us for a while. So we're able to do just the necessary stuff this time. That's Representative Edgar Starnes, the House Republican leader from Hickory. You passed enough legislation for the last one, you think? They're trying to spin this as a battle between the kinder and gentler House and, speak, and Speaker Tillis versus the staunch ideologues in the Senate. That's nothing more than bait and switch. Uh, Touch your neighbor and say, they must be high on some of that Mountain Dew or something uh, to think we're going to believe that. See, if you're an extremist to the 10th power, 
and you didn't decide to be an extremist to the ninth power, you're still an extremist. Let me tell you what happened. It's gamesmanship. They saw your protest. That's what happened. They saw the poll numbers. 55% of North Carolinians oppose taking unemployment. 58% of North Carolinians say accept Medicaid expansion. 61% of North Carolinians oppose using public school money for vouchers to privatize schools. 55% of North Carolinians oppose cutting corporate taxes and taxes for the wealthy and then raising sales taxes. 68% of North Carolinians oppose cutting early voting and straight ticket voting. And 55% of North Carolinians oppose fracking and oppose coal ash and oppose undermining environmental protection. church, I'd say slap your neighbor a high five and tell them they must be out of their mind. And so this legislature didn't want Tillis to have to face the voters without doing something to try to look moderate. You know, he had to do something to raise our embarrassingly low teacher pay. But interestingly enough, they raised pay for teachers by cutting education. So they're not robbing Peter to pay Paul, they're robbing Paul to pay Paul. In fact, they try, they're trying to rob Jesus, <laughs> the truth. Don't they realize that teachers can add and subtract? They took $76 million from the state university system to try to make up a hole created by their unnecessary tax cut. Don't they know that a teacher who gets a 7% raise and then a 3% cut can figure out that it isn't a 7% raise anymore? The extremists still refuse to expand Medicaid. The House spent three years attacking Medicaid, but blocked the Senate proposal. Yeah, right, sure. That's supposed to make us happy? No. And that's why even a Republican mayor in Bell Haven has taken on these policies. And with Bob Zellner, walked 273 miles to Washington, D.C. last week to dramatize. <laughs> to dramatize as a conservative why extremist policies concerning Medicaid expansion are wrong. Despite all of the fictions and the contradictions, you may be tempted to think that the right-wing extremists in the General Assembly have had a Damascus Road conversion experience, but don't you believe that? The budget they passed includes another round of tax cuts for the wealthy and big corporations, but it only takes place after January, after the election is over. You know, it's like waiting until New Year's and then boxing up your children's meager Christmas gifts and mailing them back. And even one ranking Republican senator made an outstanding claim. Listen, listen at the hypocrisy in the language. She said the budget was great, but I'm not sure we can sustain it. <laughs> and she was one of the four Republicans that voted against the budget. One of our Moral Monday speakers, where is she at? She's a teacher out there. Came, where is she at? Came down to Raleigh. Is that you that came to Raleigh? It was another one that came to Raleigh and spoke. And where's the one she has some connections to Republican families? She's out here somewhere, and she said something that I'm going to repeat. She said, the people of North Carolina are not stupid. Yeah. And so, my friends, that is why our movement has power. An agenda of love and hope. We believe that North Carolina can have a pro-labor, anti-poverty policies that create economic sustainability by fighting for employment, for employment and living wages and the alleviation of disparate unemployment and a green economy 
and labor rights and affordable housing and targeted empowerment zones and strong safety net services for the poor and fair policies for immigrants and infrastructure development and fair tax reform. We can do this in North Carolina. Yeah. We don't have to go down this road. In North Carolina, we believe we can have educational equality by ensuring every child receives a high-quality, well-funded, constitutional, diverse public education. That we celebrate our teachers. That our children have access to community colleges and universities. We can do this in North Carolina. We believe in North Carolina we can have health care for all by ensuring access to the Affordable Care Act and Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and that we can protect our environment and protect our lives. We can do this. We believe in North Carolina we can have fairness in the criminal justice system by addressing the continuing inequalities in the system and providing equal protection under the law for black, brown, and poor white people. We can do this. And we believe in North Carolina we can protect and expand voting rights and women's rights and LGBT rights and immigrants' rights and the fundamental principle of equal protection under the law. That is why we have had a sustained moral and constitutional critique. Somebody say 67 weeks. 67 weeks. For 67 weeks since last April. And if you add the seven years prior to that, that's eight years and 15 weeks. Over 125 different actions. With our transformative co co coalition, we have built and we have re reached out to unlikely allies. And you should be proud today that because of your actions, we have shifted the center of political gravity in our state. Everybody in the nation is talking about you and people got arrested for civil disobedience. A thousand clergy have joined our ranks. 80,000 people, more than any March 6th Selma, showed up in February. Our lawyers are fighting in the courts. 47 young people are in 50 counties registering votes from now till the election. When we started, the governor was at 50% in the poll. Now he's under 30% in polling. When we started, the legislature was at 40% in the poll. Now they're at 18% and polling. We are not losing. We are winning. We are shifting the center of The scripture says, we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul, because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The costs are too high. Somebody say the costs are too high. If we don't address systemic racism and poverty, the costs are too high when we deny living wages and leave whole communities in poverty. The cost is too high when our nation attacks teachers and undermines public education. The cost is too high when we suppress the right to vote. And we are not willing to let North Carolina pay that price because the cost is too high. And that's why we can't turn back now. Turn to three people and say, we can't turn back now. And that's why today is not just Moral Monday, but it's the Moral March to the polls. Oh my God. Because 2014 must be an election on, not an election off. We must blow the mind 
of MSNBC and CNN. When November comes, we must make them see we ain't never seen nothing like this before. And so I come today to ask you, will you call on everybody to register at least 10 to 15 new registered voters? Will you go get the 200,000 white women who voted in 2008 but didn't vote in 2010 and tell them, come on, my sister? Will you go get the 400,000 African Americans who voted in 2008 but didn't vote in 2010 and say, what's up, my brother and my sister? It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time for the New South to rise again! Well, let me close. 51 years ago, when I was born, this nation was in a moral crisis. There were governors whose lips were dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. They were defying the 14th and the 15th and the Amendment of the Constitution. They were stuck along with their immoral allies in the attitudes of racism and classism. They had no shame. One of them even declared in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. In that moment then, those who wanted to move forward were called outside educator, agitators. During that time, violence accompanied the moral crisis. Mega was killed. Children were blown up in churches for simply wanting to go to integrated schools. Even a president who was no raving liberal was killed. White people were killed like Viola LaRussa and, and James Reeve, a Unitarian preacher. But in that moment, the devotees of justice and freedom, they did not shrink back. I want you to remember that story and use it, Judy, as motivation today. They didn't have the money. They didn't have, Carol, the political votes. They didn't have the majority of political opinion, but they did not shrink back. They marched. They organized. They built coalitions. They rallied young people. They engaged in civil disobedience. They lobbied. They turned moments of despair into movements of hope. They came together. They lifted up the moral and religious principles of justice and love and fairness. And they won. Oh yes, my parents were public educators and they were a part of that generation. And they declared in 1963 after I was born, we can't turn back. They joined the moral crusade to change the nation and the world, and they did. They changed the immoral realities of racism and classism and the sins of injustice. They changed the world because they would not turn back. And I want to say to you today, we can't turn back now either. I want to say to you today, Ella Baker is not here. Martin Luther King is not here. John F. Kennedy is not here. Abraham Lincoln is not here. Our forefathers are not here. Our foremothers are not here. Cesar Chavez is not here. Elizabeth Scandis Staten is not here. But we are their children and we are here. We will resist extremism together. We will lift our state where it belongs. Together, let's vote like never before. Together, let's organize. Together, let's speak truth to Bible. Power, my Bible says that when Moses and his rod and his people got together, 
they changed systems of injustice and Pharaoh had to come down. History tells me that when Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and white abolitionists got together, they tore down the systems of slavery. History tells us that when black men and women and white men and women and Jews and Gentiles and Catholics got together to follow the dream of a better world, they broke the pact of Jim Crow. History tells us that when Sojourner Truth and, and Sister Stanton got together, they won women the right to vote. And I heard that when mountain folk get together, you are a force to be reckoned with. Especially when somebody is crazy enough to poke the bear. Uh, but I want you to know that I don't just know about togetherness from the Bible or from history. A few years ago, my doctors thought I would never walk again. And I was in a wheelchair and I was on a walker. And if it was back then, I could not do what I'm doing today. But I stopped by to tell you that when my doctors and my nutritionists got together, and my therapists got together, and when my family got together, and when my friends got together, and when my swim coach got together, and when my faith got together, and when my mind got together, and when the prayer warriors got together, tell us what's not possible. Yeah. Who here today? I wish my friend, where is she from? Mitchell County that came down two weeks ago. She's in this, is it Debris? Stacy? Tracy. 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 Tracy, you here? Deaton. Deaton, you here? If she here, come up, but I want you. How many of you will commit to register 10 to 15 people to vote? Become your own registrar. How many of you, you know, the folk that fought before us, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have email, they didn't have Google, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have a cell phone. We have all of that and we can do better than even they were able to do. Now I want a little altar call a voting registration and organizing altar call. I want a hundred people, a hundred people that are coming, where are organized, where are the blue shirt organizers, run up here, stand right here. Where you, which county you with, babe? Transylvania, huh? Idale, huh? Yancey Mitchell, Retarga, Retarga, Asheville, Buckham County. I'm good. I need 20 people, 20 that will come and say, I'll come and help. You are already from Ash, from Buckham. 20 people registering, five people a day for 10 weeks. That's 1,000 new registered voters. Somebody come from Buckham out in the crowd and join. Is there somebody from Transylvania? Is there somebody from Mitchell? Just, just, just tell, tell, they need some help. 
that will help them move in some places. And we going everywhere. From the church altar to the ballroom. It don't make no difference. We're registering everybody. We want to fool them. Like some of y'all just come down symbolically. We'll catch some of you. Come on down if you'll help these young people. They're taking their whole summer. They could have worked and made a whole lot of more money doing other things. Come here, Yara. Come on down. Come on down, some of you, symbolically. How many of you have a voter registration uh, application with you today? Where are they? We got some blank ones out there. Anybody got a blank one? We want you to get one before you leave. Now, there are some uh, three other speakers. Don't move. Madison. Madison County. Madison. Somebody from Madison. You do it from Madison. All right. Y'all will come here a second. And while they're coming, just come quietly. Sign up. Everybody doesn't have to come. But while you're there, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, if we all get together, if we all do this thing together, we can show the nation and the state a voter turnout like they have never seen before. Are y'all ready? Y'all are going to sing real briefly. Don't leave. We got three more speakers that you need to hear from and then we'll be leaving. God bless you tomorrow. Mountain Mall Monday. I love you.